Okay, everybody. Well, <laughs> my name is Dana Woods, and I'm in the UMAC um, Fellows Program. And it is, I'm very excited today to introduce uh, my friend and former colleague, um, Sheila McGuire Riggs. Um, so I have some things I wanted to say about Sheila. Um, I've known Sheila for over 20 years now. We are both native Iowans, right? And um, Sheila's been someone that I've admired and sought counsel from throughout the years. Um, she's had an incredible life and career journey and has reinvented herself many, many times, right? <laughs> to pursue ever-evolving interests, both professional and uh, personal. Many of us in the UMAC program have been talking about a portfolio approach to life, and Sheila actually lives it. <laughs> Sheila has an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Creighton, and earned a Doctor of Dental Surgery DDS from the University of Iowa and a DMSC, right Sheila, yeah. Doctor of Medical Sciences in Research Intensive in Epidemiology from Harvard. Um, we first became acquainted um, 20 years ago when we both were working at Wellmark Blue Cross and Blue Shield, the health plan for the state of Iowa and state of South Dakota. And we collaborated on some very cool projects, uh, many of which have remained among the top 10 of my professional experiences. I joined the company with absolutely zero experience in healthcare <laughs> or confidence, really insecure. And Sheila became a patient mentor and a collaborator to me and my team as we went forward and jointly uh, published something called the Wellmark Report, was really ahead of its time. And we collaborated on a lot of grant making through um, the uh, Wellmark Foundation. Sheila left Wellmark in 2005 after a 10 year tenure and moved here to the Twin Cities to become president and CEO of Delta Dental of Minnesota and later here at the U chair of the Department of Primary Dental Care, her first love and passion. <laughs> um, I'll let her describe her journey here in the Twin Cities which has included many board leadership roles in various for-profit and non-profit organizations including the Women's Health Leadership Trust, <clears throat> which is an organization that she helped to found pretty shortly after you came here. The Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable, the Greater Des Moines, or Greater Des Moines. Boy, it got into my language, didn't it? Greater Twin Cities, <laughs> United Way, YWCO, Benko Dental, the Cargill Foundation, and you're currently serving as chair of Hennepin Healthcare. Sheila is also, you may not know this about her, nationally known leader in the Democratic Party, having served as the Democratic State Party Chair in the state of Iowa. She ran for Congress. She most recently helped her sister-in-law, Andy McGuire, um, run for governor of the state of Iowa. And as I remember, you are on Hillary Clinton's shortlist as a thought leader <laughs> when she was forming her campaign. Uh, she was one of a handful of women that Hillary invited out to help her kind of vet ideas and think about um, how to position herself. And you're currently, as I, you sent me an article this morning, it sounds like you and the uh, McGuire family are very plugged into Amy Klobuchar's campaign. Um, it sounds like you'll be serving some hot dishes maybe yes. this weekend, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I recommended to Kate that um, Sheila would be a, a great person to come share her story of transitions. Um, and I hope she'll touch on really the gutsy strategy that she undertook uh, when your uh, position at Delta Dental was eliminated and how you went about kind of networking and uh, approaching the community. Before I forget, oh. here's your, your <laughs> love and gift fun. from Phyllis and Kate. Oh, oh, oh gosh, thank you, Dana. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, I, can everyone hear me okay? And and is there some camera somewhere? Or back, back there? Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, good, good. Well, I am so honored to be here today when Kate and Dana uh, reached out. Um, once I started thinking about it, and uh, as you'll see, I'm going. 
I went through nine layers. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I guess I am appropriate for talking about transitions. And uh, but I first want to uh, start out. Um, I uh, d had a little medical procedure today on, on my thyroid, so don't. In case you see this bandage, I just wanted you not to wonder what it was. I had a little little biopsy. Um, next, uh, uh, I I wish. I could, uh, but everything Dana said about me, I would say right back uh, to about Dana's role in my life and how critical it was. And uh, as I talk about, uh, particularly uh, one of one of my legacies, Dana uh, was a co-author of one of my uh, lifelong legacies uh, that I'll talk a little bit about. Do there happen to be any other Iowans here? One, okay, good. Good, a li little bit of Iowa taste, great. Just, uh, just I, I know how much I can have to explain. Uh, and then before I really get on to layering on rather than leaning in, I want to applaud all of you in this program uh, for uh, taking steps to become more <laughs> self-aware, to be very intentional about it. I had no idea about this, uh, again, until Kate and Dana reached out to me. Uh, and I've already started to tell others about it. Because uh, I, um, <coughs> I feel it's really wonderful and bold of you to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, you all just could kind of have stayed in your what you were doing, but to stretch and become more self-aware is, is really something, and so that inspires me. And so I want to applaud you and thank you for that. Uh, let's see, I'm going to move this over here. Whoops. So um, as Dana gave you a little preview, um, I have uh, had nine layers. Uh, and I stand here, I'm almost 59 years old at 58. Uh, I have, what's emerged um, is five mantras uh, from these transitions. And uh, I'm happy to report that when my head hits the pillow at night, uh, I rest comfortably because how I reflect back, I'm very proud of uh, four legacies to date. And, uh, one um, one thing I uh, some of you may have heard this mantra that it actually isn't even one of my five mantras is you know there's only two really important days in your life the day you were born and the day you realize why you were born and uh, so uh, I'm still on that journey I I think by the legacies I've I've, um, that have emerged I, gives me some sense of why I was born. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing today. But I have to tell you, as I started out uh, layer one, so I grew up on a farm uh, as the youngest of seven kids outside of the town, Holstein, yes, like the cow, <laughs> Iowa. A uh, very small town, and education was our ticket off the farm. And uh, I had two brothers who were orthopedic surgeons, and I thought, oh my God, I don't want to work that that hard. And so, from the age of seven, Sheila was going to be the dentist. Every time anyone asked me, Sheila, what are you going to be? In? I'd say, I'm going to be a dentist. I'm going to be a dentist in Storm Lake, Iowa, which was the big city, 20 miles away. And uh, so I went through uh, Creighton and uh, got into dental school and and uh, just never gave it a second thought. M my whole life was to drill and fill in Storm Lake, Iowa. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what you know about dental school, the first and second year is a lot like college. I do really well there. But I got into clinic. I hated it. <laughs> of a millimeter really matters in dentistry. You should all be in awe of your dentist and even your orthodontist son. <laughs> because a quarter of a millimeter really matters in dentistry. And it had ne I had never been tested or it never occurred to me, I'm a big picture person. So to think for 40 years I had to worry about a quarter of a millimeter in a dark upside down wet back corner of a mouth I, I, I literally went into clinical depression because I had one thought my whole life to layer one, to be a dentist in Storm Lake, Iowa. So I will tell you uh, my transition strategy there was panic. 
<laughs> and because uh, I had never had it literally you know when I even applied at dental school they said now if you don't get in what will you be and your son probably was asked that same thing and I you know said the guy uh, I'm gonna get in so I don't really have to ever have a plan B so uh, layer two uh, I discovered I was a big picture person, started doing research and loved it, and uh, there I found out about this program at Harvard that I never dreamed I'd get in, never dreamed I, a girl on a farm from Holstein would ever go to Harvard, and uh, but I, I got in, and again, as Dana said, I spent six years in Boston doing the big picture of disease trends. That's what I'm wired to do. Data geek, disease, big picture, and epidemiology, and and uh, that was uh, layer two. Now, I came back from Boston to Iowa uh, for my uh, 30s, and uh, layers three. Uh, was politics and corporate America. I came back um, actually very um, uh, interested in politics and uh, when I first came back uh, I we had an open congressional seat in Northwest Iowa. How many remember Love Boat? The show Love Boat. There was a character named Gopher. Fred Grandy. How many people know he was a member of Congress in Northwest Iowa? And uh, so he decided uh, to run for governor. We had an open seat in 1994, and I, w I won the Democratic uh, nomination. Never really planned to do it, but uh, it was the best thing that ever happened. I really encourage everyone to get civically involved, no matter what the party. Uh, it is a, it's a wonderful thing. It was not a good year for Democrats in 94, but uh, it was uh, really... Um, uh, just an incredible experience and that transition strategy um, is uh, you know networking uh, it's not what you know uh, it's who you know and I again I never really thought knew that that was something that was really real uh, until I came back and really saw the power um, uh, that it wasn't what I knew uh, it was who I knew. I had done a nice job of running for Congress, so I had uh, uh, the opportunity to join Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, and that's the corporate America part. Um, and uh, as Dana noted, she, she and I co-authored my first legacy. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this way of talking to communities about the disease levels that we knew about uh, from claims data, and it was um, uh, kind of a new new thing in the market to turn data bits uh, into stories for communities, and just it remains a very proud uh, legacy of, of Dana's uh, and mine. And uh, you know, in the in the middle of that is my fourth layer. Uh, at age 35, um, I met the man of my dreams, um, and I would say that transition strategy was uh, when you least expect it. And uh, so um, uh, we uh, we do not have kids, which is we decide not to have kids, which I have to tell you really helps the rest of my layers happen. <laughs> We're, uh, we have 30 nieces and nephews, but uh, you know, that's, that is something to, to really think through, particularly the side of the room. Um, and uh, so that is layer four. Then uh, my 40s, um, and this mantra is nothing just happens. And um, I, uh, you know, this is, again, why I'm inspired by your intentionality of being here, because it really does uh, take very intentional things, uh, actions, uh, to, to add Nick's layers uh, to your life. Um, uh, while I was, um, an executive with uh, Dana at Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, I started to join some not-for-profit uh, boards. 
and um, one of them was uh, because of my analytic uh, abilities, Delta Dental of Minnesota reached out to me uh, to be on their uh, board of directors. Now, why do you? S I want you to really understand the depths of nothing just happens. So, um, you know, out of the the blue, Delta Dental of Minnesota asked me to join their board of directors, and uh, they, my our boss. <laughs> said I couldn't do it. And uh, I thought, I could have just folded. I could have just said, oh, okay, you know, I won't do it. But I'm like, no, that's not right. <laughs> I will take vacation days. You know, you cannot deny me this opportunity. And uh, so, you know, stand up for your rights, uh, reframe things if someone tells you no and you really think you should be able to do it. Um, and uh, uh, I did join uh, the board of directors of Delta Dental of Minnesota, which is part of a later my later story. Uh, also, um, as Dana noted, um, another kind of what you call not-for-profit board was the Iowa Democratic Party. Uh, Iowa is a great place to be involved in politics, as we all are hearing from the Iowa caucus stories ad nauseum, I'm sure you think that. Um, and uh, so I uh, joined the board of the Democratic Party and then became chair uh, of the Democratic Party. And uh, is, does anybody here know what I mean by the van? Does anyone use the van? Okay. Uh, so, if you happen to do gr grassroots democratic politics, particularly door knocking or calling, mm -hmm. uh, in 2001, across America, um, both parties had a very rudimentary system, flat data files, um, and because of my experience at Blue Cross Blue Shield and working with big data and, and just how I kind of view the world. When I walked in, I thought really data should be much more accessible and usable. And so um, I wrote an RFP for how a relational database should be built where we add all these fields and we can slice and dice and empower people and and uh, we uh, tested it out and uh, that year uh, which wasn't that good a year for Democrats Harkin and Vilsack Senator Harkin who uh, served in the uh, was Paul Wellstone's closest friend and Tom Vilsack who was governor of Iowa uh, who became Secretary of Agriculture uh, were both on the ticket and we got them reelected which was the first time in Iowa's history a uh, Democratic senator and a Democratic governor had ever been reelected because it is kind of more of a red state uh, than a blue state. <coughs> so um, this was uh, I just wanted you to really understand kind of this this theme of layers and mantras and legacies. Does, does VAN stand for some word? Oh, at Voter Activation Network mm -hmm. is what uh, the company, so my biggest mistake, while I wrote the RFP, the company I hired, um, I did not buy 10% of it. <laughs> because uh, while we did it in Iowa in the 02 cycle, um, by 06, all 50 states uh, were using it, and still to today, uh, all 50 states use the use the van. And uh, so every election night, I think I did my part. <laughs> That's what I mean. When I had hits the pillow, I'm like. Did my part, created the van. They do use it, and I didn't recognize it immediately, but it's very easy to oh, use. Oh, yeah. Like, this is, this is <laughs> real, it's designed to make it easy for lots of people yeah. to door knock or call or anything. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and what, so I, you know, I wasn't involved for a number of years, and then I started doing a little bit here in Minnesota, and now they have this app. They call it the minivan. The minivan. I think that is the cutest <laughs> yes. damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you, you just never know where some of these ideas will go and land. Oh, let's see here. So, um, 
Then uh, in my 40s, um, because I'd stood up and uh, didn't take no for uh, an answer, um, the uh, my colleagues on the board of directors, uh, board of director of Delta Dental Minnesota, asked me to to be the CEO while we looked for someone to acquire us. And um, so, uh, since I have a little time, I have a funny story here, uh, also about nothing just happens. The uh, as Dana noted, this was about the time uh, when Hillary Clinton was going to uh, run for president, and. Um, so I was still living in Iowa, right, and been uh, asked to be the CEO, and but you know you have a lawyer and a contract, and you know and all this as you're signing your uh, deal like that, and it is it's gone kind of back and forth between the lawyers, and uh, it's right up to the point where you know I need to kind of start work in the next week or two up up in the Twin Cities and get my family moved and everything, and. But uh, Senator Clinton uh, calls, and she had invited a group of us Iowans uh, to her home in Washington, D.C. And so I'd, I was flying to D.C., and the chair of, of the board that I'd be reporting to uh, called, and he said, Sheila, I hear you were like chair of the Iowa Democratic Party. And I went, well, yeah, you know, and, and I'm actually dug in D.C. And, and, you know, I'm on my way to, to Hillary Clinton's home. He's like, how does that happen? And, 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 and I'm like, well, Doug, you know, I'm from Iowa, and that's what the presidential thing started. And, and he was like, well, we have to add a clause to your contract. You can't do any politics in Minnesota. <laughs> And you know, and actually, I had already said that to myself. You know, once you have a job like that, you really can't be partisan, and and particularly, you know, a lot, you know, our customers are gonna, clearly going to be from both sides of the aisle, and so I wasn't going to do anything. But it's just funny how, you know, nothing just happens. You know, even at the last uh, moment when it's even extraordinary things are going on that you get to sit down next to Hillary Clinton in her house, you know, <laughs> for dinner. Uh, it it can take turns you, you don't anticipate. But it all worked out and I moved to Minnesota and, and uh, knew, uh, knew no one. Uh, I knew the you know the seven other board members, and and uh, so I have to tell you, you know Minnesota, if you uh, want to network and want to join groups and get involved in not for profits, you know it it's really doable uh, here, and uh, you know so it, I've just had a wonderful uh, launch. Uh, in my first few years in, while I was in my 40s being CEO of Delta and then we were successfully acquired by WellPoint uh, which was what, what we wanted so now turn so then I was turning uh, turning 50 let's see which book do I want on this one? Oh, this one all right this one and do you have the handout that I I yes. sent ahead I sent it electronically oh okay all right Printed. So um, when um, when WellPoint acquired 90% of us, um, I was looking to see what else um, to do. Uh, a private, kind of a private company version of this is called Navigate Forward. I don't know if anyone's uh, heard of Navigate Forward. And so I too, just very intentionally, uh, step back uh, to see uh, what I should do next. I was turning 50 and, and I would say that the intersection I cared about was uh, what work needed to be done and I wanted to go somewhere where uniquely of all the people they could hire I would add 10 percent more value than somebody else they might hire. But that, that's just how I framed it. And uh, so, I don't know uh, how many of you have ever seen the book, uh, The First 90 Days. 
and love it, really important. What I decided to do was kind of adapt from that uh, the questions that they suggest and to do kind of an environmental scan of um, to get to land on in this intersection that I really cared about. So uh, what I did was um, sent these six questions uh, to, through, kind of through my circles and through my networks, to 20 healthcare leaders and 20 business leaders. And uh, to really see uh, what's the biggest challenges, why are we ch facing the challenges. This was the really important question. The most promising unexploited opportunities for transforming the health of our state. Because I tell you, you know, business leaders care, really care about health because it's a really expensive uh, thing on their, uh, spread on, in their bottom line. What would need to happen to exploit that opportunity and then, you know, kind of my favorite, uh, I asked, I don't think this was really in the um, uh, first 90 days, but if you had a magic wand and it would clear your calendar for two years, uh, what would you focus attention on? And then, uh, to make sure I was really understanding who were the thought leaders in this, I asked everyone to name the three leaders, besides you of course, uh, who have the most influence in driving healthcare transformation in Minnesota. And it was really uh, an unexpectedly transformational thing that I uh, learned uh, from this process. I think uh, Kate shared with you, I had one of uh, Twin Cities Business Magazine actually asked me to turn one of the questions into an article uh, that she shared with you. But it also, uh, when I did decide it was the University of Minnesota that, that uh, fit, fit that intersection, uh, it also uh, set me up for convening uh, across uh, the Twin Cities in Minnesota uh, in this space that I hadn't uh, really anticipate would, would happen. So this was a major inflection point. So, um, as I said, layer seven uh, was coming uh, to the university, um, primarily as chair of the Department of Primary Dental Care, where we produce the next generation of general dentist, dental therapist, and dental hygienist. But also, we have a major, major grant here at the university called the Clinical Translational Science Institute. And I've been doing my darndest to uh, I was talking to Kate with, about this earlier. The university folks aren't very good partners with the community. And there's not, for very good reasons, there's not a lot of trust between the two. And so we've been really trying to work particularly on the issue of doing medical research in a trustful way with the community uh, has been a part of uh, academia. But you might say, well, what? gave you the cred credentials uh, to just walk in as a department chair, some of you. And I would say, yeah, it was a, a stretch. That's why my mantra here is, you gotta crawl before you walk, before you run, uh, in terms of, you know, kind of any new, new initiative uh, that you dive into. Who here has heard of dental therapy? Yay. What would you like to tell us about it? <laughs> This is a new, I, my father and sister are dentists in practice, oh! and they just hired a dental oh, therapist. They're yay. very excited in yes. rural Minnesota where it can yes. be harder to get a trained dentist to move. Dental yes. therapy has expanded a lot of options for them. You can see why it's a legacy. Uh-huh, I can. <laughs> They're going to be enthused. Yeah. So you, we've, we've all heard of uh, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, uh, but the uh, profession of dentistry has not had a mid-level provider for they have for one of the two major diseases of course you probably all love your dental hygienist and the hygienist name usually a she uh, is focused on you know there's gum disease and decay 
And so the hygienist very successfully has helped dentists with the gum disease uh, issue. We've never had a mid-level provider uh, around decay. And we are the only state uh, where dental therapists practice, and we are the only dental school that educates and, and uh, produces uh, dental therapists. And so I'm very proud in my department, we educate general dentists, dental therapists, and dental hygienists, which we think is a, the future uh, for the oral health team, particularly in rural Minnesota, underserved areas where um, you really, do not, you know, a dentist is really highly trained and they should be working on crowns and dentures and implants, but, um, you know, up until dental therapists, they most of their day was drilling and filling, you know, which uh, can be done by mid-level providers. So we really lead the nation, uh, the University of Minnesota does. And now uh, 11 other states have passed the law, the scope of practice law, but no dental school that, uh, to be frank, dentists don't, you know, were, oh, were uh, hesitant with this change. Open it up. Um, <laughs> and I'm yours. So, um, other states, dentists uh, have kind of said to the local dental schools, no, do not train dental therapists. So, uh, there's still not yet another dental school, even though the laws have changed in 11 other states. Uh, the one most likely to happen is Massachusetts, where Harvard uh, is going, is, sees this as so essential. Yes. So yeah. what is it about Minnesota that made it possible to, to launch this yeah. in the face of um, professional barriers? You know, I, I think in the DNA of Minnesota, healthcare, in a, a lot of healthcare innovations have come. Uh, both delivery systems and payers and just, I don't know what it is, um, if it's kind of the, uh, I don't want to use socialism, but kind of the not-for-profit uh, environment. Uh, it doesn't surprise me Minnesota is the home for it. Also, in the moment when this was happening in 2009, we happened to have um, a Democratic um, House and Senate here in Minnesota, and a Republican governor who wanted a solution. And so it just kind of crescendoed at the right time uh, for it to happen. Um, all right. Now, uh, my 50s, as I said, I'm, uh, I am uh, almost 59, and so I'm, I'm living my layer eight. You're seeing me in layer eight. Um, uh, I, um, let's see, what was the, I want to make sure you all know about the first, the, the 20 minute networking, is this one of your resources? Oh. Yeah, so that we haven't officially read it, and we have okay. parts of it. Marsha Ballinger. Yeah. Marsha Ballinger, yeah, who's right. a, this is a, by, written by a local woman who's very, we're very lucky to have in our, in our community. Um, so I, um, this five years I am really focused on a for-profit board service. Um, Benco Dental is a competitor to Patterson. I don't know if anybody, a dental supply company. Um, and uh, the Cargill Foundation and while HCMC is not for-profit, it's a billion dollar health system that I was uh, chair of, of that board. Um, and I've also done uh, some policy development, kind of went back to a little bit uh, more of the weaving in some politics. There's a group here in town called Women Winning uh, that focuses on electing women of all parties uh, to uh, elective office from park, park board to mayor to Congress to, to the White House. And uh, because of that board service, I've gotten to know a lot of uh, elected officials. And it was Sharon Sells Belton, the long, uh, longtime mayor of Minneapolis, that was on the HCMC board. And that's how I got onto the HCMC board, is um, Sharon thought I'd be a, a good board member. So, um, and uh, 
just you know a little little insight here about why this is my mantra no one just walks away from power uh, some of you may have read in the paper that uh, while I was chair at HCMC we had to switch uh, there's a switch there was a switch in CEOs and uh, I had always kind of observed that it's, most people don't walk away from power. I had to live right in the moment <laughs> of that uh, and what that was like when you employ 7,000 uh, people and have a billion dollar health system that uh, you're in the middle of. It, it happened to be when it was 52 below uh, when the transition needed to happen and uh, this um, just kind of always keep this in the back of your mind when you wonder why change isn't happening or why transitions are difficult because it is really hard for people uh, to walk away from from power and um, I was honored two years ago to uh, get the alumni of the year uh, so kind of went full circle from um, Growing up in a farm outside of Holstein, Iowa, never <laughs> thinking I'd be any further away uh, than 20 miles to have had uh, that, that experience. So, lastly, what's my next layer? What's layer nine? I am right in the middle of it, thinking about what is layer nine. And so, uh, uh, I, this is why I was like, so glad I got to come here today, to, uh, because I'm going to ask you to help me with one of my ideas. So, um, I thought everybody used this mantra, but I've heard that that's not everybody thinks of it this way. I think there's 10,000 of everything in Minnesota, not just lakes. Is that a new thought? <laughs> oh my God, there's like 10,000 not-for-profits, you know, 10,000. It's, there's, I mean, you start with, there's nothing twin about St. Paul and Minneapolis. Like, who'd have thought? Dana, did you realize how diametrically opposed these two towns are? You told me, right? <laughs> <laughs> right after I came here. Yeah, yeah, like, the one nope. that taught me, too, hey, everybody's friends card's full. Don't take it personally. Yes, yeah, that too, <laughs> that too. All my friends are people who moved here from other yep. states. Um, so, um, you know, it's this, I think we're all in this together. My layer nine is your layer of uh, what uh, being here today. And so I really do, I, I see these as half full. Um, uh, and maybe where I'm landing is a little bit of every layer of the, every bit of the pieces of the previous eight layers. But, um, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna spend the five, minutes on this one so you know you can kind of read what what these are but um, so this is what I need help with so uh, for a thousand years just to be frank you know men made the money and the women raised the kids or you know, men went off to work and women maybe went to work but raised the kids and so there was just for a thousand years there was this kind of dynamic. I mean typically. I'm sure there were some really woke men forty years ago. <laughs> but you know, but what when I stand back as a big big picture person, I really believe Dana and I and uh, uh, many many women here are, are really in a cohort that has not yet to be named. And that cohort, and the, the thought I've given it is that it's a cohort of women who were born between 1945 and 1970. So just park that. Right now they are 50 to 75. We really are the first cohort ever to be self-sufficient economically in big numbers. You know, not one-off, not the first. Um, and so, A, I want you to help me think what to name this cohort. Baby Boomers have a name. Gen X has a name. What does this cohort of women, what should be the name? Why th 
could I mark off 1945 to 1970? Well, their mothers got a taste of this self-sufficiency and kind of having to run things during World War II. So their mothers had a taste of it. Birth control started to widely, widely be available and legal. Title IX, the divorce stigma went away. Um, my female cousin, three years older than me, was in the first class of women of Notre Dame. You may not realize this. Male <coughs> prestigious colleges and universities did not allow women in. They had a sister college. But it wasn't until about 1977 mm -hmm. that Harvard, Yale, Notre Dame, all these places allowed women in for the first time. Uh, and so there's now really, uh, it's very normal and equal for the medical school classes to be 50% women, law, dental. So we, there's finally like a bolus. And we don't have a name. And it's different. It is really different to in, in that power dynamic of men and women in this country. So that is your homework. As I uh, as we get to one o'clock and we go to the Q and A, is uh, to help me think about crystallizing this. And and I wish I could be here Monday to t to listen to the U.S. Census woman, because she's kind of uh, presenting on a similar uh, piece of it. And uh, but I'm going to be at the Iowa caucuses Monday, so so uh, so I will leave uh, my remarks at that, and we'll go to Q and A. Who's going to be the first? <laughs> See, I want this pass the area. You may not know we do women. <laughs> are not in the Constitution in Minnesota or federally. I highly recommend equal means equal. 95% uh, of America thinks women are in the Constitution and they aren't. And because of it, their, their pregnancy discrimination is legal, pay discrimination is legal, and there's a, a third one, but this is a great book about that. It's interesting we have Gloria Steinem coming to yes, campus. Yes, I got a ticket. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, and I'm going with my 23-year-old daughter. Oh, okay. So I, I think I, I'm really curious about you know how you see that um, that first group that you know 1945 to 1970 maybe being different from the young women who are stepping into. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, so 70 to. 2000. 2000. Yeah, I mean that. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a that is a different generation cohort. Yeah. 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 I mean, we could. There should be dissertations about our cohort and what that's meant then for your daughter's cohort. But, but I want to first name yeah. this cohort because it, I think it's just really significant. Mm -hmm. Yes. What I write about is that uh, this is the first, uh, the, this boomers in particular, is the first cohort where women had jobs they could retire from. And yeah. I mean, this yeah. is, they, because before they left yeah. Um, yes, yeah. work, but they left often jobs that were pickup jobs that they had or maybe did, but it wasn't the main job. And, they would say they were retired when their husband was retired. I remember my mother saying, we're retired, meaning they're both retired. And and now it's a, a real thing. And women are having uh, difficulty, and couples are having some difficulty oh. coming to grips with yeah. timing and yeah. and the nature of exiting yeah. the workforce. Yeah. Because the workforce has been so important for this cohort of women. So I think you're on to something yeah. there. But I wanted to ask you about the Book of Mantras. Are you oh. writing that? Or oh. You so here's, um, 
you know, the reason really why I became a dentist was because I hate to write. <laughs> and, which is kind of ironic because, you know, as an academician you have to write a lot. But so I've never seen myself as someone who would write a book. Uh, but uh, I'm just kind of collecting these mantras and I don't know if it'll be a book, but it just, and, and maybe I'll write my own eulogy and uh, these mantras will be my uh, eulogy and then I'll make my nieces and nephews have to live by them. I don't know. <laughs> How about yeah. the, oh. the generation of first? <laughs> I'm We've got the greatest generation yeah. together, but women were the first, that's the first time they got to do many, many Oh, many. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Equality trailblazers. Yeah. And I like your equal means equal, right? So yeah. there's got to yeah. be something in that. Or equity paradigm busters. Or <laughs> I mean, this is, there's no wrong answer at this yeah. point. <laughs> so the, I can't see your card name, but the gentleman in the blue. Oh, it's George, because I don't have it out. Um, uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot because yesterday our that cohort we were talking about purpose and why. So as you think about your nine layers and maybe what's left to do, what would you say your why is across all of those changes? Um, or purpose. Purpose statement. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, it's really, um, You know, I think we all feel like um, what we, how we see the world is how everyone else can see it too. And so I've come to learn, I really do see big mega trends uh, and differently than the average bear. And so if I have that gift, I should crystallize it and put it put it down. And my very first instance of that was the Wellmark report. Uh, I could just instantly see that we could tell these stories and we could know. And no one had ever thought to do anything with claims data before Dana and I uh, sat down and realized all these fields in a a claim, you know, when you go to the doctor, the doctor sends a claim into an insurance company. All these data bits could tell a story that's been never told before. That leads to and then it leads change. To change right. and health improvement, yep. empowering information. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I have more of a policy question to ask you. Um, when we're talking about Medicare for all, is that also for dental then? Then did all dental care would be free yeah. as well? It <laughs> is, uh, you know, it is the weirdest damn thing <laughs> that you have bacteria in your arm and no questions. You go to the doctor and you get taken care of bacteria on your arm. All decay and gum disease is, is bacteria. That's all it is. Bacteria excretes acid and the acid either causes decay or it causes gum disease. And that some, and it was because of, it happened when Medicare uh, was formed because the American Dental Association won the battle and stayed out of Medicare in 1964 or whenever. And so the two worlds have just been separate since then and it's, uh, it's unfortunate uh, because, you know, I always say, you know, if governors and presidents only had a toothache one night and they couldn't get care, they'd be they'd be on our side to make sure everyone has access to getting rid of that toothache. You know, it's the number one reason kids miss school uh, is a toothache. It is seven times more prevalent than asthma. And while Medicaid and CHIP has a dental benefit. You know, a lot of dentists uh, don't really want to treat, I mean, just aren't as confident treating children, nor do they want to take this, the low payment. And um, so it's, you know, for so many people who are healthy, it's the 26th problem on their plate. But if you have a toothache, it's number one. 
It's and not included in most Medicare plans. It is. Oh, it's not in Medicare. Oh, no, it's the number one oh, yeah. request. Is that what you're yeah. Thinking? It's the number one request by yeah. our members. Could we have dental, dental. coverage, please? Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. before your needs. And so is that something that you're promoting as the head of the dental school, that, that it, there should be the Medicare for all would include dental care as well? We, uh, the American Dental Education Association, uh, is very supportive of the bill that passed in the House. There is actually legislation being passed <laughs> but that's different than impeachment uh, these days. The House did pass a Medicare improvement that did add dental, and it is sitting uh, on a, a Senator McConnell's desk as we speak. So it would add uh, dental to Medicare. Now, Medicare for all, that you know, that's kind of a different different. different thing. But just plain Medicare, the House has added it. Mm -hmm. so. uh, could I just ask why the why they didn't want to be in Medicare in nineteen sixty four? Well, I think we'll ask the physicians here. I think the, the doctors wanted to be in Medicare. There was an enormous fight in '64. Reimbursement structure. Somehow, LBJ was able to make it happen. But um, and you know, it's probably <laughs> the single most popular program. You dare not touch Medicare. And people wanted it, and they finally got it. But the doctors would have stayed out if they had the choice, just like the dentists did. You know, it's because they just don't want, um, you know, back then, physicians like dentists still today were really running small businesses. Uh, you know, dentists still, 80, 70 to 80 percent of dentists are still one or two dentists in an office, kind of like your dad and sister. And, and um, so, you know, what they're thinking of is regulations and government, we're the government, we're here to help you, you know, the kind of... Uh, Narrative. It's, it's this old thing about socialized medicine. Yeah. You know, it's it's a, an evil, yeah. according to that camp. And it's, well, it's, it's what we really need is single payer. It set up the structure, though, for reimbursement underpinnings that yeah. we still have today. Still have right. today. I mean, really, so Medicare. Medicare is reimbursed. Is it goes back to the Johnson administration's change and it's morphed. Not, but really, not that much. No. No. You know, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield is really Medicare A, a Medicare B. Yep. You know, the physician and the facility side, you know. Uh, yeah, the physicians are in a different position. Yes. Very, oh, sure. there are very few physicians just in their own little office. Correct. Right. They're, with, they're now employees of the hospital. Right. For, yeah. And I don't think that's any improvement over employment by the government. Yeah, yeah. But Dennis, that you're, you know, you're exactly right. So back in 64, physician offices and dental offices, I, I think, I mean, I was three. Uh, but, you know, they, but dentistry really hasn't changed since then. Where medicine, the, the employment structure of physicians have really changed. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What's reader rules? Well, <laughs> um, Rita was my mother. Oh, and yes. uh, why I have a little bit of this, I think, in me is um, she sat me down. She had pancreatic cancer and sat me down. And she, she did, she and I wrote her eulogy. And she had 12 Rita rules. Wow. And uh, so with 30 nieces and nephews, um, uh, mother, my mother would have turned 100 in three months. And so uh, there are 19 women descendants of my mother. And uh, so I have hired a writer, because I hate to write. And uh, she is interviewing the 19 women and asking how the reader rules came alive in, her, in their lives. <laughs> And we're publishing a book, although I'm not writing it, <laughs> on my mother's 100th anniversary, oh, on my mother's 100th birthday, and it is Rita Rules. Can you tell us some of the, her rules? So uh, the number one is seek a job in the public so that you can really see how differently people live. Uh, have the courage of your convictions to be an innovator. Don't overparent. 
<laughs> uh, I had uh, one of my, one of the seven of us um, had uh, schizophrenia, and so one was accept the concept of chemical imbalances. Um, be aware, not beware, be aware of changing business models. She was brilliant, clearly. <laughs> so now uh, this writer is interviewing the 19 women to see how, in fact, uh, these came alive in my families. Yeah, so thank you for asking. All right, we're at 114, Kate. <laughs> Any last burning questions? Well, Sheila, yeah. thank you. Oh, thank yeah, you so yeah, much. yeah, thank you. Cheers.